Hello and welcome to another online Bible study with Pastor Bill Brown. We hope that you have enjoyed our series through the book of Proverbs. We haven't tried to be completely, um, do it exegetically, uh, to go verse by verse, chapter by chapter, not even subject by subject. We've just drawn from the book of Proverbs in 12 different um, lessons, 13 if you want to call the introduction, so this would be 14. I'm going to call this number 13 in that series. But we've tried to get you some things to ponder, to learn, uh, to gather up some wisdom to encourage you and to excite you to uh, read this book, put it into your life every day and let it enrich you. Um, we're primarily going to be taking from a verse that's towards the end of the book for our title. I could easily just call this the words of the wise, but in fact, we're going to kind of alter that title um, from verse 13 and call it the conclusion of the matter. Even though we're going to focus on verse 11 that you see at the bottom of your screen, where it, it says, and you can see it, the words of the wise are as goads and as nails fastened by the masters of assembly, which are given from one shepherd. These are God's words. Oh, yes, Solomon wrote them, but God inspired Solomon to write them and to record them for us, for our benefit. He tells us where they came from and what they can do and how they got here and what they will produce in our lives. We know it's Solomon, and I want to use really this whole chapter, but breaking up the verses in different ways. But we know it's Solomon. What does he call himself? The preacher. He says, for moreover, verse 9, because the preacher was wise, he still taught the people knowledge. I think that's a reference to because Solomon is much older. In his older age, he had gotten taken away from the right path. He had faltered in his walk with the Lord, but he was recovered. He saw the vanity of vanities and the vanity of life disconnected from God. So it says that he still taught the people knowledge, yea, he gave good heed and sought out and set in order what? Many Proverbs. So it's these from these verses, I want to draw some conclusions, again, about why we should study Proverbs and why we should value the words of the wise. I think we ought to further identify something about the identity of the life and the life experiences of the man who through wisdom turned from his wisdom for a time and then returned. But remember that this wisdom is from God, it's not faulty. And the wisdom he penned should not, cannot, and praise the Lord if it's for you, it could not be discarded or forgotten. All is not lost through his failures. God used faulty men. His words are wisdom and they are still valuable and they can teach us a great deal. So we're going to look at three things in that verse, verse 11 primarily. We're going to draw from it. We're going to look at the preacher. It was the preacher who was wise, the words of the wise. Who are the wise? Who is it? We're talking about the preacher here in this one. And then we're going to look at the product. That's the words of the wise. And they are descriptive. They do something. And then lastly, we're going to look at the provider. Solomon made it clear that this wisdom was not his own. That this wisdom came from God. Um, he tells us about his heritage and his place of honor. In this book, he just talks about the words of the wise or the words of the preacher. Uh, that were wise. In this same book, of course, at the very beginning, he talks about that he was uh, described as the king of Israel, the king who ruled in Jerusalem. He is the son of David. And though he talks about that at the beginning, when he gets to the end here, I think he's very humble. And he talks about not that he is the wisest man on earth, nor does he say this is King David, nor does he say anything 
further about his heritage, but he claimed to be a preacher. That particular word draws the picture of one who gathers people together and preaches to them, heralds forth the truth. Solomon was a mentor. He was, in our vernacular today, a life coach, unlike any we see around. He was an advisor, very different than what we see today. And he told us how this wisdom was personified. He talks about, remember, wisdom was like a, a woman who was proclaiming loudly in the street and calling for students who would be willing to listen, to learn, to come, and to sit and take in this wisdom. Solomon never ceased being a student. He wasn't always a teacher, and you can see this in verse 10. Look at it come up now where he talks about, again, the preacher sought to find out acceptable words. He studied before he taught, before he preached, before he used those words, he sought to find out acceptable words, and that which was written was upright, even words of truth. These were words that were deliberately and carefully chosen by him. He also knows that God inspired him to write them. That's why he calls them words of truth. But that doesn't mean that he's going to be careless in his presentation of them. He knows that God is using him. He also knows that he's near the end of his life. He has repented from his wayward years and he sees the vanity of living apart from the reality of a right relationship with God. When you begin to seek Solomon, he did everything that you could possibly do and he tasted of every worldly and fleshly pleasure that you could. And yet he says, all is vanity. What matters most is having a right relationship with God. That's why he says, let us hear the conclusion of the whole matter. That's where we get our title from. Hear the conclusion of the whole matter. What is it? Fear God and keep his commandments for this is the whole duty of man. Solomon, even at the end of his life, is not focused upon his death or even the brevity of life or even his wasted years. His focus is to turn our attention to that relationship with the Creator. That's how he started this whole chapter off in verse 1. Remember now the Creator, thy Creator, who created you, God did. There's where your value is. There's who values you most and who is going to give you wisdom that will really guide you, keep you centered, focused, and bless you. Remember now thy creator in the days of thy youth. Don't waste your youth. He says, while the evil days come not, nor the years draw nigh, when thou shalt say, I have no pleasure in them as you get older, we just wait to go. There's no more pleasure in them. People oftentimes don't know why God's keeping me around. I'm ready to go. Whereas when we're younger, we jump up, man, we're ready to go. It's different when you get older. The preacher is encouraging the young to recognize your creator. Live your life in as if in his sight and by his grace and in his mercy at all times. Don't push him away. Don't diminish your creator's influence in any way. And in the end, you will be greatly pleased with the outcome. In the end, you understand that your life came from him and it will return to him. That's what we read in verse seven, then shall the dust that's what we are. We are nothing but dust. We will return to the earth as it was. And the spirit, because see, this is not all we are. This body will go into the ground. This dust will return to the earth as it was. And the spirit shall return to God who gave it. Those endless days of energy and abounding joy will fade. They will fade away and disappear just like our ability to soundly sleep. 
talks about how easy it is to wake up that old man with the birds. We hear them chirp, we wake up. When all of these disappear along with your strength and your abilities, what matters most is your relationship with God and that will become more valuable as time goes on. Again, though he emphasizes in this book of Ecclesiastes the vanity of vanities and his own failures, he also emphasizes the book of Proverbs and the can't say it, the dependability of this divine wisdom. The encouragement, make it valuable to you now. And if you'll do so, your latter years will be sweeter than ever. Now let's turn our attention not just to the preacher, but the product, the words, in other words, of the wise. This is the product of the preacher, the Proverbs that we were talking about. He mentions in verse 10, he says, the preacher sought to find out acceptable words and that which was written was upright, even words of truth. Verse 11, he says, the words, so we were talking about the words of the wise, are as goads and as nails fastened by the masters of assembly, which are given from one shepherd. Now, this is good advice for every preacher or teacher. The words that we use to teach God's word ought to be sought for, prayed over, studied about, and there ought to be some labor and self-discipline involved. Solomon, as wise of a man as he was, it says that he sought for acceptable words. That means pleasant and dependable words of truth. He took pains to make these words acceptable. And that word really does mean both pleasing and profitable. He wants them to enter into the heart and the mind of his hearers. But of course, we know the only way that's going to happen is through the mighty work of the Spirit and his grace. But these words, very different from those mentioned in Romans chapter 12, or 16, excuse me, in verse 18, got that wrong, where it talks about the way that some people craft words who serve their own belly and whose speeches deceive the hearts of the simple. That's not Solomon's purpose nor goal. The preacher sought out pleasing but profitable words of truth consistent with the design of making men upright and providing them with a righteous path in which to walk. Notice how he describes these words. He says the words of the wise are as goads. They're as nails fastened. The word goads is a reference to the rod that the uh, folks in that day would use. They were designed to drive the oxen, to direct the oxen. The oxen we know are huge beasts, strong, and of a rebellious sort, just like man. Goads were intended to drive or to urge, to incite, to excite, to stimulate, to motivate, and even to invigorate. You know, the driver of the ox or oxen doesn't sit there and poke and prod constantly and draw blood, but his rod gently nudges his oxen in the right direction though oftentimes it makes them uncomfortable. It was just by them understanding that little poke was a change of direction. The nails fastened by masters of assembly is a picture of a, a tent peg or a well-placed sturdy peg fastened on a beam. It meant something from, that you could hang something from securely something that was easily accessible and quickly retrieved and an item often used. That's the way these proverbs are. Put them away in your heart and they'll be like that which kind of pokes you every once in a while, gives you the right direction, but it's also that which gives you a security, 
a foundation. These are something that you can easily access and use them in your everyday life. These words, he says, are like nails fastened by master craftsmen. In other words, they are proper, properly, accurately, and appropriately placed by those who God uses, who God has gifted, and who God has moved to speak. That's the word picture. It is giving us the value of these wise words. These wise words, the product that the preacher produces, give us direction, and they lay a foundation, both of which are always advantageous to us and for us. The words of the wise set a course or a path which is the most profitable and listen up, it's the most pleasurable. Now, when you get argument to that, just remember that comes from the flesh, the world of the devil, because it's the flesh that has different desires and different directions, and the flesh will argue the points of both until you are absolutely exhausted. But remember, the words of the wise are his goads and his nails fastened by the masters of assembly, which are given from one shepherd. Now, though we have master craftsmen around us who set the nail, it is always God and God's spirit that gives those men and their words value. Notice again, they are given from one shepherd. Verse 11, the words of the wise are as goads and as nails fastened by the masters of assembly, which are given from one shepherd. Well, that one shepherd is Jehovah God. He's our savior. He's the one who redeemed us, who reconciled us, and who loves us with an everlasting love. David, in Psalm 23, in verse 1, said, The Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. Isaiah said in 40 and verse 11, he shall feed his flock like a shepherd. He shall gather the lambs with his arm and carry them in his bosom and shall gently lead those that are with young. God is the director of the master craftsman. He is the author of the acceptable words. And those are the words which will guide us and secure us. His words are sweet to the soul, edifying to the spirit, and educating to the regenerate mind. Two, you can notice that he is gracious. They are given from one shepherd. They are distributed. They are poured out. They are made plain, and they are provided for any who will listen and attend to these words. And he has made sure that these words have been preserved for thousands of years, even today, way past the time when they were written for you and I. Again, notice it's the Holy One, which are given from one shepherd, the one shepherd that is unlike and above all other shepherds. He is your creator. He is your provider. He is the eternal one. He is the unchanging one. He is the holy one, the distinct one, and he is the judge of all. When you look back through it, it talks about how that every spirit in those final verses, every spirit will return to God. Why? To be judged of him. We will all give an account. Look at verses 13 and 14. Let us hear the conclusion of the whole matter. Fear God. This is what the preacher says, and this is the product that he gives to us. Fear God and keep his commandments, for this is the whole duty of man. Why? Because God shall bring every work into judgment with every secret thing, whether it be good or whether it be evil. One writer said, that this is the true and finest fundamental nature of man, not just his duty, 
In other words, it is living for God, living in reverence to him and for him and obeying him is our created purpose. That is our finest fundamental nature, but we lost it in the fall. A man must be recreated, reborn, saved, and then refashioned according to the way that God made him. This is the sum and the substance, and it gives you your greatest purpose and power in living and in preparing for eternity. Remember, and this is what he's saying in this whole chapter, this life that you and I are now living is temporary, but it's preparatory to eternity. It prepares us for the next. Does the wise man now have your ear? Does the preacher have your attention? Listen to him. His words will guide you and secure you to the one true shepherd who gave his life for you. If you take God out of the equation, vanity of vanities, all is vanity. Put God in the equation and that's what makes life different and profitable and pleasurable. The greatest achievement in life is not what you can achieve on your own and apart from God, but the greatest achievement in life is that you can connect to God, stay connected to God, and find the profit and the pleasure in being connected to God. Does that mean everything's gonna be perfect and wonderful? Why no? Because we know there's going to be trials, there's going to be tribulations, but we can assign different meaning to all of those events when we are connected. And I'm talking about vitally, not mentally, but spiritually, from our heart connected to God. As you did continue to study, and I hope you will, in the Proverbs, remember their source. They come from God. Remember their purpose is so that you might fear God and keep his commandments. Remember that they call for us to fear and reverence and obey God. Learn, <laughs> I'll just say it this way, learn this earlier in your life and the earlier the better that you learn it to live your life in connection with God. Let these lessons guide you throughout your life. Don't leave after the things that Solomon left. Return now, repent. These words of the wise will keep you on the right path. They will connect you and keep you connected to the right source. And they will give you an unmovable foundation, an assurance that when this life is over, you will know you'll be connected to the Holy God of Israel, our Lord and our Savior. I pray that's been a blessing to you in this whole study. Um, I also want to make mention, um, if you've been watching these in order and you watch them um, from Sunday to Wednesday and so on, um, because I made mention of it Sunday, that we would be setting a date for a solemn assembly. Um, and that right now we've set temporarily for October 28th. I say temporarily because things might change, but that's what we're hoping to look for, that we would set that. And it is a Sunday that we set aside, and we'll give you more about that later. Um, but it's a Sunday that we set aside. We won't be preaching, but we will be reading a lot of scripture. We will be praying, and we will be singing. It is a different day patterned after the Old Testament solemn assembly that Israel experienced, but we're bringing it into the New Testament to encourage revival, restoration, reconciliation, and of course, redemption for any who are not saved. We pray that this has been a blessing to you. We look forward to coming to you again with the word of God. If you have any suggestions about a study that you'd like to hear or see, send us a note. Uh, send us an email, write to and through our Facebook 
um, or through our YouTube, give us a message. Um, we have our email that's posted on our webpage and on our Facebook. We'd love to hear you, uh, hear from you, and uh, hopefully we can encourage those of you who are listening. Lord bless you.